If you love boxing, you're gonna love this. Hello and welcome to episode 27 of the Box Nation podcast. I'm your host, Dev Sarni, and this week I am joined by a man who, well, if you were to throw him to the wolves, he would come out leading the pack. It is, of course, <laughs> Mr. Steve Lewis. How are uh, you, Steve? Oh, I love it. I love it. There's only one you can better that with, and I'd want one with an intro where if there was one piece of steak and I was one of six tigers chasing that piece of steak, you'd have to you know, savage me to stop me getting it. That's the only <laughs> intro that can beat it. But we're here, number 27, and we're all laughing. That's incredible. Yeah, I was actually going to say that one next week anyway, so but you've <laughs> taken, taken it off. Off me now, Steve. So, Steve, there was no live boxing over the weekend. Uh, a rare weekend without it, and I, I found myself sort of scratching walls, twiddling my thumbs. You know, I, I had to even had to talk to Mrs. Sarney, bless her. You oh, lived, what did you, you do? Sport. I had a peaceful <laughs> weekend. I had, I had yeah. a few things on. Uh, you know, it was okay. I will leave it at that. My weekend, but. Um, I'm glad you actually spent the weekend talking to Mrs. Sarney. Yeah, got to, you got to, got to talk to him, haven't you? Uh, well, this week we hear from Australia's WBO World Welterweight Champion Jeff Horn ahead of this Saturday night clash with pound for pound star Terence Crawford. A former Jeff Horn opponent, Gary Corcoran, will let us know what he thinks of Horn's chances. We've also got a bit of Tyrone McKenna, a bit of Louis Petit, plenty of bad jokes, and the best boxing chat in the game. Enjoy. Well, this Saturday night live on Box Nation is one of the biggest fights of the year. Two-weight world champion and pound-for-pound pound superstar Terence Crawford is stepping up to welterweight after winning world titles at lightweight and becoming an undisputed super lightweight champion. So that's that was all four belts that he got there. So he's stepping up, he's jumping up to 147 pounds, and he takes on the undefeated Australian Jeff Horn for the WBO world title. Boxing experts and most observers outside of Jeff Horn's family are picking Terence Crawford to do the business. Well, I caught up with Jeff Horn just as he was about to board a flight to Vegas last week, and I asked him, what are your plans ahead of the big fight now you're heading to Vegas? Look, I've got a bit of training to do once I'm over there. I'll be doing some pads and bag work with my trainer, Glenn Rushton, over there. And um, I guess just doing a session a day, I'm sure there's going to be some the media that I'll have to get done once I arrive, um, some press conferences, the weigh-in, uh, all that's got to get done before the actual fight takes place. So this this is your first fight outside of Australia. So what well, I mean, how, how does it feel? You've gone from Australia to the the absolute mecca of boxing in Las Vegas. Are, are you nervous? Well, I've, I've fought in New Zealand before, but that's no different from Australia, really. It's like travelling um, to another state here. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've I've travelled I've travelled all over the world as an amateur, but never for these massive fights as a professional boxer. And it's been years since I've been this far overseas for a big fight and um, I'm really looking forward to showing my skills and showing my worth over there. We got a few. Uh, we got a few questions. I, I put up on Twitter earlier a little bit of hashtag Ask Horn, and um, people have been coming in with some questions. So I'm going to fire a couple at you. We got Craig Davis over here who says, "Do you feel more pressure for this fight than for the Pacquiao fight, and are you treating it the same as kind of being the underdog?" Um, I, I am treating it the same as similar to the Pacquiao fight. I've got heaps to prove for this fight. I feel like I, I didn't gain the respect that I probably deserved for that Pacquiao uh, win. A lot of people don't think I actually won the fight, thanks to the commentators um, on the fight. But um, I'm going over there to, to, to prove my worth and to have a, have a good, strong fight and, and to win, of course. Does it wind you up? This because uh, there's a kind of narrative out there, especially you know you you probably heard back, of course, the comments from Teddy Atlas and and people like that who were saying you didn't win it. Like, do, how much do, how much does that eat at you? Look, I could get let it bother me really badly, or I could just let it go. And as, as I do, I'm a, I'm a pretty easy, chilled, laid back guy, and um, I don't let that type of stuff, what other people's comments, worry me. If I did, I'd be a puddle of Pull the nerves on the ground. Um, I'm, I'm just get my job done. Hopefully, I can transfer a few people and get some respect. And um, I'm not going to worry about all the naysayers. And a question here from Paul Kinsey 
So he's asking, heading into this fight with Crawford, do you see anything other than natural size that you'll be able to exploit on the night? So I guess that's a case of what what what, what can you do to to kind of upset Terence Crawford? Look, I've just got to outbox him. I know he's a supremely superb boxer and, and can fight all different styles, but um, I, I think I've got a style that can upset anyone out there, and and that's what I plan on doing with Terence Crawford. I know my size won't be massively different to Terence, but um, it's definitely going to be an advantage in the later rounds um, if it makes it that far. Suggesting perhaps you could get him out of there early, Jeff. Yeah, it's possible. Um, if anyone, either of us catch each other flush, um, I'm sure it'll be lights out. What well, one of the one of the the real themes from the, uh, the the Twitter responses has been that you you're the world's toughest school teacher. Well, one of the questions here is you you are. This is from Marshall Boxing. First a school teacher, then a boxer. Jeff has done two of the toughest jobs out there. Which is the hardest, and what are the similarities? Would you go back to teaching after boxing? Look, um, teaching is definitely a, a, a job that is extremely difficult, and um, I definitely commend all the teachers out there doing such a great job. Um, I think I would stick with, with boxing these days, but only for a short period of time. I don't think I will be going back to teaching, but... Um, Hopefully I've got, I've got enough money to be able to do whatever I want and teaching was a very rewarding experience but I think uh, um, I'll finish with the boxing career first and then have a think about what I'm going to do. And hey, you, you might be taking Terence Crawford to school on June the 9th, eh Jeff? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's the plan. And we got one here from Boxing Scallywag who says, what would you rank as the bigger win? Would it be a win against Crawford or the win against Manny Pacquiao? Look, I've, I've got to say, oh, it's, it's a, such a hard one. Everyone keeps saying Manny Pacquiao wasn't in his peak and all this, um, so that kind of diminishes that win slightly because everyone's like, well, we doubt that he was at his, at his best. Everyone knows Terence Crawford's at his best, so at the moment, um, look, I class Manny Pacquiao as an absolute champion and I, I rate that as one of the, my biggest win ever, but um, after this one, I don't know, I might change my mind, but... I think Terence Crawford is definitely a big hurdle to, to climb over at the moment as well. It feels like one, Jeff, where if, if you were to win this fight, you'd kind of walk into the top five pound-for-pound pound fighters in the world, whereas the Pacquiao win didn't do that. Yeah, that's right. Um, look, I've, I've reached number one on box rank, which I was very proud of. Pound-for-pound um, pound rankings are all, all different, and hopefully I can manage to, to snag and at least get top five, as you say, and... That will be an extremely proud moment for me and my family. A couple more questions for me, Jeff. I know you've got to catch a flight. You've got to get out to Vegas. Um, tell me, yep. from, from your perspective, what happened with the Bradley Skeet fight? Because there, there was a moment on, on, on this side of the of, of the pond, so to speak, this side in the UK, where it looked all set to go that you were going to fight Bradley Skeet. And then that didn't happen, and you fought Gary Corcoran, you, you got the win, and, and you've moved on to this fight. But in your words, what happened with the Bradley Skeet fight? I think the, the manager and the coach, the coach looked at uh, Bradley Skeet and just saw him as an awkward type of fight and um, not an exciting fight that we kind of want to be in. So he's a very hit-move type of boxer and we thought Gary Corcoran was a very... He, like threw plenty of punches and it would make an exciting fight. So that was the reason why we, we steered towards the entertainment factor and we're like, well, a lot of people are going to be watching this and we're building our brand over here and we want to make an, a real exciting fight. And we thought possibly the, the ski fight was not going to be as entertaining. Well, the Corcoran fight was certainly a, a bit of a cracker. So, um, yeah, I'm sure you yeah, guys exactly. will stand by that. Um, so we, we've got... Uh, We've got a 2 and O flyweight over here in the UK. His name is Harvey Horn. Yep. Now, it would, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you if you had any advice for a young Horn. <laughs> um, that's a pretty cool name, I must say. But um, I, I guess just keep training hard. That, that's the biggest thing in, in the sport is just to stay mentally strong and keep training hard and um, keep good people around you all the time. He's he's got probably the best nickname in boxing, by the way. I, you know, I'm a big fan of the Hornet. I think that's a great nickname. He's gone for Horny Harvey Horn, which is a uh, which is quite something. That is that's, that's a good one. I, I definitely got um, people to tell me that 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 name. <laughs> I just didn't choose it. 
and understandably so. It's, it's, um, there's been some MCs which have kind of shied away from it at this end. Uh, let's see how he gets on. Um, so tell me, Jeff, have you got a message for your UK fans? We've got a lot of Aussies here actually in the UK, so I'm sure there'll be plenty tuning in on Box Nation. What's the message? Look, the message is I'll be fighting my heart out come June 9 um, in America, and um, if anyone wants to see a, a good fight uh, that, I, that I, I'm going to win, against uh, one of the pound-for-pound pound best fighters out there. Uh, tune in, because it's going to be entertaining. And what's your prediction finally, Jeff? I'm going to win. That's my prediction. I don't know how, whether it's on points or whether it's a knockout, I just know I'm going to win. Well, that was Jeff Horn. Steve, just before playing back the interview, I said only his family are picking him to win. Am I being harsh? I mean, this is the man that beat Manny Pacquiao. A, a 2017 version of Manny Pacquiao, but all credit to him. He was in the right place at the right time, just like Ricky Hatton was for Kostya to do. Let's not hold that against um, Jeff Horn. He's delivered when he's had to, and, you know, he he deserves this chance. You know, he's won all 18 fights, I think, or 19 fights, won 18, got a draw. And, yeah, there is um, that, that aspect of nobody giving him a chance outside his nearest and dearest. I was um, reading the, the Sydney Morning Herald a little bit earlier, and obviously there's a mass Aussie pack out in Vegas, and their headline was, Lost in Vegas, Jeff Horn knows he is a pawn in the top-ranked game. You know, what, that, what the article was insinuating, what, he's entering the ring as champ, but he's an afterthought for top rank because they know that should have been Pacquiao. And the plan was cruel for Pacquiao. Jeff Horn's come along, ripped up the script, and we've got to give him kudos for that. And uh, But, you know, what he's got, he's full of confidence. And, you know what, in Australia, there there, there is some sort of hope for him. Even Jeff Fennick, who was uh, the victim, I think it was Andrew Zaman Nelson, the first fight, a bad, bad decision. He he's been said, beware of the judges in Las Vegas. And I think they've even sorted that out, that there's an Australian judge, an Italian, and a local judge, which uh, not having two local judges is something pretty much unheard of for Las Vegas. And look, okay. his big hope is that his physical size is too much for Crawford. Well, he, he's, he's, he's saying in the, in the interview as well, he feels like he didn't get the respect for the win over Manny Pacquiao. I mean, he's still got Manny Pacquiao on his resume. I actually thought he won the fight. Yeah, I know Teddy Atlas, a lot of the guys, I, I, I think we, you've got to look at the context of the Pacquiao-Horn fight. So ESPN had just done a huge deal with top rank. Pacquiao was their main star. He's come on, first fight, Australia, wonderful show. What he's just lost, oh my God, can't believe it kind of thing. So a lot of the narrative, a lot of the Teddy Atlas, you almost, they were trying to tell the viewer stuff that maybe wasn't happening. I saw Jeff Horn busy. I thought the UK commentators, John Rawlin, Barry Jones, they were really on point as well. I, I'm pretty sure John Rawlin was uh, was saying a lot of good stuff for Jeff Horn. I know he was out on his feet at some point in that fight, but he was busy and I gave him the fight. So why is he not getting the respect he deserves, Steve? You've just said it there. The Teddy Atlas comments that now, I mean, you, you come up with a great narrative there about ESPN, the massive and fantastic deal they've done with Top Rank as well. Let's not, you know, beat about the bush oh, and the boxing on the apps. It's a fantastic deal for boxing and Top Rank cements their position as the number one in America for a long time to come, whoever's going out there soon. But um, the Teddy Atlas thing, and the comments and how outrageous they were blew everything out the water. And um, of course, I think it was a ninth or tenth round. Horn had that terrible three minutes, Dev. Um, yeah. But he come through, and I was in the studio that day, and I thought he won the fight by two or three rounds comfortably. Yeah, okay. no, no, no controversy at, at all. But you know what? He deserves kudos because he's gone and done it. And you know, he, yeah, he's only had that one fight since against Gary Corcoran. And you know, yeah. I'm sure Gary will tell you. In the interview, what what he what he will do, what he thought of you know of mm -hmm. that fight, that um, but no, um, Jeff Horn deserves more credit than, than he, he's been getting. Although he is a huge underdog in Las Vegas, and as the um, you know, it's the, it's all about making Terence Crawford a star this in America and marching on towards Crawford versus in the super fight against someone like Errol Spence. You know, I I love Crawford as um, a fighter. He absolutely fascinates me as a character. You know, he's a brilliant, brilliant boxer. Um, he's clever. Um, he's strong-willed, and you know. But then you also get side of him away from the ring. He's had misdemeanors with the police before, yeah, most yeah. recently. And then there's another side to him. In 2014, he went to Rwanda with one of his former school teachers and uh, left every bit of clothing he took 
Uh, I read a story of when he won the gold medal at the 2007, I think it was the Pan American Games. He saw how the Venezuelan team had no money, no nothing. He left them all his kit. You know, there, oh, there's, wow. there's, there's, there's something about this guy where I find him really fascinating as a boxer and a person away from the ring. And that's why I think I followed him also so closely since that win over Breedis Prescott when we what? first featured him on Box Nation. I think that was around 2013. That's where he took your money, wasn't it, Steve? He took my money, and how silly do I look? <laughs> how silly do I look? Right. Uh, I, I was, I'm l- looking now, you know, up, up until then, it, you know, it, you know, he'd been be- he'd beaten, you know, Sydney Sequeira, 19 and 60s previous fight, Hardy Paredes, 15 and 10, David yeah. Rodella, 16 and 5, Andre Gorges, 11 2, Angel Rios, 9 6, you know, and before that, he'd hardly beaten a man with a winning record. So, you know, understand why I back three oh, yeah, yeah. give, give me, Give me a break <laughs> on that. <laughs> Steve, there's a couple of stories that uh, have emerged. Uh, this week in, in regards to this fight. I just want to pick your brain on a couple of them. So Jeff Horn is now in Vegas and he's been complaining about there being no air conditioning in the top rank gym. He's complaining about the conditions that he's having to face as a champion traveling out there. What would you read into that? OK, he doesn't have to use the top rank gym. There's a million and one gyms in Las Vegas to use. <laughs> I've been to the, the last time I was at the top ranked gym was before Ricky Hatton fought uh, Castillo. Was it um, out there in or is oh, this yeah. at July in 2009? Two, I can't exactly remember it's when. Before uh, that. Yeah, yeah. It was the hottest. I want to do remember it was the hottest I've ever been in Las Vegas. Was there higher conditioning in the top ranked gym? I can't remember, but there's a million and one gyms to use in Las Vegas where there'll be air conditioning. Now, he talks about what a great team he's got around him. They should be looking into things like this, what sort of air conditioning yeah. would suit the gym or not. So I don't buy into that. His team should have looked into that. And if they don't like it, find the gym. Top rank don't hold a gun to their head. So you have to come to the top rank gym. There's, there's, yeah. there's millions of gym. There's the IBO gym, which a lot of boxers use just off the strip. That's been popular with British boxers before. Amir um, Khan uses that one. Yeah, I think I think it's slightly concerning that this this is kind of come up in fight week. He's got yeah. there. You, you feel as though they should have someone should have done their their research. But done their homework or just moved to yeah. another gym. So we're not yeah. satisfied. You know, we're the champion. Where's the, the aircon? If they said there's no aircon, thanks very much. We're fine. We'll train here today. We're finding a gym tomorrow that hasn't has got aircon. Go and pay for another gym. I'm sure he's earning enough money to pay to close another gym for a couple of hours. Well, the other story, Steve, and, and this is again, it seems to it seems to be coming out that perhaps Horn is a, a tad unsettled. Uh, it's to do with the gloves. Now, have you heard about this one? There's no, a, you, there's hey, a... you you fill me up with that. There's a con- there's a kind of glove situation going on where Jeff Horn is for the first time being made to use horsehair gloves for the first time, which apparently means that the knuckle is more exposed, which yeah. means there's a higher chance of a knockout. Yeah, now knockout. Horn, uh, yeah, Horn apparently has had some hand problems in the past. He's never worn these sorts of gloves before. He's got a week to adjust to them. So yeah, what what, what do you make of that? Again, it's something you sort out in the contract. Mm. You know, I, I I don't have it at all. Well, why wasn't this arranged? These are the gloves he want to wear. He's the champion. You know, he's getting paid well by top rank. He's locked in. But when you do the contract, don't just look at the digits at the top saying you will earn this much growth. You know, you will train in this gym. Look into this when you sign the contract instead of just, you know, what they're earning. I've I got no sympathy with the Jeff Horn camp at all. Well, let, let me ask you this now. If Jeff Horn does it. Let, let, let's just remind ourselves here. Jeff Horn is the world champion, okay? He beat Manny Pacquiao, he's had a defence. However, this will be a boxing upset. How big a boxing upset will this be? A champion retaining his belt against a challenger? It sounds strange, doesn't it? But this will no doubt be a boxing upset. Where does it rank for you, Steve, in terms oh. of boxing upset? Because if Jeff Horn does this, Terence Crawford is top five pound for pound. By, by general consensus, he is a star on the rise. Jeff oh, Horn, can he be the man to do it? I don't think he is the man to do it. Um, but up, uh, you know, top, you look top boxing upsets. You go back to yeah, Tyson. Yeah, you, you're going back to you're Tyson going back being to knocked out. Trying, by... There will there will be something. You, yeah, you go back. Jeff Horn beating Manny Pacquiao oh, was, yeah. a, was a was a massive upset. This one is an even bigger upset, without a shadow of a doubt. You go back to um, 
you know, it, it's, it will be better. What about Roman Gonzalez losing to Rung Visa in 2017? Yeah. That was a big upset at the time. You know, mm. Rung, Rung Visa hasn't proven himself as such an accomplished champion since. But that, that was considered an upset. But it's certainly bigger than, say, you know, Saddam Ali beating Cotto, what we've had in recent times. Yeah, I, I think so. I think this is one of those, Steve. So if, if he's beaten Manny Pacquiao and then he goes on to beat Terence Crawford, I reckon he could be calling up Oval McKenzie and saying, hey, you used to call yourself the upsetter. Do you mind if I just take that nickname off you? It, it's, it's one of sports great in the end. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it is one of boxing's greatest upsets because Crawford, and to me, it would be one of the greatest because, as you know, I'm blown away on the American who's 32 and zero. I think he's 10 or 11 world title wins. I love him. He just gets better and better. He's 30. I should think in the next 12 months, we're going to see the best of, of Terence Crawford. Absolutely. Well, Steve, I've dug something out here. Now, I mentioned it last week about, uh, I recall Tim Bradley saying something about he sparred Terence Crawford and then that's how people knew about Terence Crawford because he kind of put it on him. So I've got Terence Crawford here actually talking about that sparring experience and how he turned heads that day. In late 2010, a call came from Palm Springs, California. Timothy Bradley wanted to hire Crawford as a sparring partner in advance of his championship fight with Devin Alexander. Sparring Tim is what really got people to take notice of me because at first people was looking at me like a bar fighter. And when we were sparring, it was totally different because it was like, all right, it was like back and forth, me and him going. And everybody was just like, man, who is this kid? Like, who is this? And he was just like, man, he's like, man, you ain't no sparring partner. I was just like, why, why you say that? He was like, dude, he was like, man, you a world champion. He was like, trust me. So, yeah, that was Terence Crawford talking about that Tim Bradley experience. And Crawford has, of course, gone on from strength to strength now. He's won world titles at 135 pounds, undisputed at 140. I'd imagine he wants to do the same at 147 pounds. What, what do you see in a fight with with him and Errol Spence. I, I, I don't want to look too far into, uh, into the future. I don't want to write off Jeff Horn here, but there's a dream fight out there, isn't there? There's a cliche that we're using a lot in boxing over the last couple of years, and then it becomes king cliche. It's boxing porn, isn't it? <laughs> you, you got know, a nice review that, based is, on that last know, week. You know, that, 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 that's, what, that, that's, that's what that sort of fight is. It's a dream fight. Uh, he's up there with maybe Lomachenko, Golovkin, maybe Garcia, who could you can justifiably make it make a, a, a question for him being the best boxer in the world? You know he's not he's not he hasn't got the personality of saying a bro a Broner or a Mayweather, but he, he's so skilled. He's a tactician. He reads a fight well. You know, and he's got that pure boxer about him. But he's not a boring pure boxer, is he? No, no, not, not I mean, at all the, you, you go back against the fight, you know, you, and he shows the, the nasty streak in him. And that, the fight with Yuri Orkis Gamboa. Oh, and that, that was good. Gamboa he, gave him a little bit of trouble in those opening rounds as well, just, right. just showing his kind of class as well. But he was just going too far up in weight. Yeah, he's footwork, jab. He can switch in. He, he's just the all, all round. You know, you see some at, um, boxers who are. You say they're not brilliant, but they're good at everything. You know, that makes them a solid world champion. He's fantastic at everything he does. Well, he's definitely expected to win. And the last man to share the ring with Jeff Horn, who is, of course, the WBO World Welterweight Champion, was our own Gary Corcoran. Now, Steve, you gave him a call ahead of his June 30th Belfast clash with Paddy Gallagher. That's on Mick Conlon's homecoming show. And here is Gary Corcoran giving his take on Crawford versus Horn and much more. Well, what surprised you the most about um, Horn when you've boxed him? Uh, the surprise was uh, <laughs> he was uh, he, he, he's better than I thought he was. He is better. You, you fight him, he's a better fighter. So he is a very good fighter. I give him that. The big part, the, the big part anyway, he has to be a good fighter. I didn't think he was good as he was. He, he was a bit, he was a bit awkward to hit. He, he's not very easy to hit. He's quite awkward. And uh, the way he fights, the way he fights, he might not see like coming up with the head, as people come up with the head, 
I don't think it's the way he fights uh, that's the reason he's heading along. And what about his strength? Was he stronger than you thought? Uh, yeah, not, no, I knew he was quite strong. I knew he was quite, he was quite strong. But I knew I could push him back. I was pushing him back for a few rounds, pushing him back. And then I just, I just, you know, it all went, it all went bad. But fair play, he's not a bad fighter. But I'm fine with his, his boxing. He, ch he changed his game. When he was fighting me, he changed his game. He changed his game. He was fighting me in the first six or seven rounds, and then he was fighting when he was getting pushed in, then he changed his game and started boxing me. Do you, do you think, um, what sort of tactics do you think he'll use against Crawford? Uh, I think he will try to bully Crawford. The reason he couldn't bully me because I was just, I was bigger than him. I was just as big as him. I think he couldn't really bully me. But with Terrence, I think he'll be a lot bigger than Terrence Crawford. And how do you think Crawford will handle the bullying tactics? Yeah, uh, I think he'll handle the better. He's a fresher fighter. He's a better fighter. Uh, I think he's a better fighter partner. Uh, he'll outbox him, I think. I just think he'll outbox him uh, later on. He, he, he might even cut to pieces and stop him there. So, um, for yourself, you know, after this, when you get back on the world stage, who's the one, who's the fighter you, you're, you're aiming for now at the very top? Uh, I'm if any world title comes, come my way, I'm, I'm happy to fight anyone. Myself, I'll fight anyone. Um, I know I'm coming back to the stage for the British, it's, it's one of the things you have to do, but I need, I need to fight another one. I need to fight another one. I need to fight another And uh, Paddy Gallagher was in that bird. So I can't look past Paddy. I, I don't think the bad fighter. There's no, there's no good step to it. Don't know it. And I box up better, so I'm coming down. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good fight. It's a good fight. I think mean, the thing with you, 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 will, you, when you say you'll fight anybody, you do. I think it's Frank Warren who's on record as saying every fight he's offered you, you've never turned it down. It's yes before you've got to the money even. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've told him yesterday every fight. I'll be honest, uh, this, this fight here just came out of the blue. I didn't know, but I, I accepted it because I need it. I need that for Anne. It's been put down as a final eliminator. No, it's not final, it's an eliminator. There's four of us in it, and Anyway, it's, it's a win that, and it's Josh Kelly or Johnny Gang. I don't want to stand his feet. I'll fight either one of them. Because I know, I know people can say, the, people say what they want in the country. So Steve, Gary Corcoran siding with the majority there. He predicts Crawford's actually going to stop Horn late on. What is your prediction, Steve Lillis? Yeah, as um, um, Gary said there, you know, Horn was a better fighter than he believed, but Terence Crawford is levels above both of them. And um, I think it will be... Set seven rounds, one-sided beatdown, and another great performance at Crawford from Terence Crawford that you just have to tune into Box Nation for. Dev, you're always asking the questions. I'm going to ask you, who wins on Saturday night? You're on the spot. I want a round. I mean, I know who wins. I was going to tease you initially, Steve, because I was going to say, hey, Bob Arum said last week, never write off the Aussies. And you, here you are, one week later, clearly writing off the Aussies. Seven rounds, one-sided beatdown. My goodness, Steve Lids, but I, I completely wholeheartedly agree. I actually think, um, oh, man. look, I like Jeff Horn. I really like Jeff Horn. We had a nice chat. You know, I had a, a bit of banter about Harvey Horn. We got on well, um, but oh, I think he's a good fighter. I think Terence Crawford is a great fighter, and I see Crawford stopping him around the ninth. That's me, Steve. You put me on the spot. And I've, I've delivered. Push me up against the wall. I'm going to push you back. Here I am. Ninth round. Terence Crawford. I said it. Big, big call. Big call <laughs> from a big man. <laughs> maybe one day. Maybe if I keep drinking my milk. Well, that's this Saturday night live and exclusive in the UK here on Box Nation. It's Terence Crawford. It's Jeff Horn. It's the WBO World Welterweight title. Crawford has won titles at 135, 140. He wants one at 147. He probably wants all of them at 147. But Jeff Horn, he thinks he can win. He knows he can win. And he wants to cause a seismic boxing upset on Saturday night. Can he do it? Tune into Box Nation from 1.30 to find out.
News emerged last week that Phil Sutcliffe Jr. had pulled out of his June 30th Belfast clash with undefeated Tyrone McKenna. Now, that was going to be a bit of a cracker. And often that can mean that the fight is off altogether or another fighter comes in at short notice who hasn't maybe trained. Well, that was not the case here. In stepped undefeated WBO intercontinental champion Jack Catterall. And suddenly we've got a clash of two undefeated fighters with an awful lot at stake. This was a huge shock that got me buzzing. It got the boxing world buzzing. And here's Tyro McKenna. Let's find out if he was buzzing. Um, it's got me certainly buzzing. Normally when I, when some pulls out of the fed, like Phil Sutcliffe did, um, you're worried you're going to get a bad replacement or you're going to get someone that you that didn't, didn't really want. Uh, but in this case, I got a, a fight ten times bigger than the original. Um, it's always great. I'm very, very excited. I know how good Jack Catterall is, but I know how, I believe in myself and I know how good I am. I believe it's going to make for an exciting fight. I bet Mick Conlon's got the ump with you too because everyone's talking about Catterall versus uh, Tyrone McKenna. <laughs> I was actually talking to Mick yesterday and he was saying about it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what, he's happy. It makes, it makes his show even bigger. It uh, excites the Belfast fans even more. So. And that, that Ireland versus it, it's not just a good fight. Ireland versus England and a good fight as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, Ireland people always love fighting English people, don't they? So <laughs> that brings an extra incentive to it. Um, it's in a home country. It's in a home city. Uh, it's under a massive show. Uh, I was ready selling loads and loads of tickets for this show, but now, since our fight's been announced, the phone hasn't stopped. Everyone's been insane about the tickets to come and support me. I mean, you mentioned Jack as being a very good fighter earlier on, and I know yeah. he'll think the same of you, obviously. He only has to look at your record and your performances. But, you know, yeah. h- how good do you think he is? I don't know, I've sparred him before, and I think I know what he brings. He will know he's very, very good. He's very strong. Um, he's a solid boxer. He's, he's slick. No one gives him credit for how slick and, and how good head movement and stuff he has. He's, he is very good. But uh, I believe in myself and I believe that I have the, the attributes to beat him. I think he may be semi overlooked me a bit. I've heard a few things, yeah. I've heard a few things that he said. Uh, I'm not as tough as opponent and stuff. So I think he may be overlooked me a bit. I hope not. But if he is, that may be his downfall. I don't think I'm a fighter that should be overlooked. I'm a six foot one, so well. Box, but I like the fit as well. And, uh, I believe that's going to bring the best out of me this fit. So, do you think your size, you, you know, the size advantage you'll have come fight night could be vital? I know he's solid, yeah, you know, solid for the weight, but you're huge. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, anyone six foot one in the late welterweight division or super late division is uh is going to give anyone trouble. A southpaw, a southpaw on top of it, though he's up as well, but uh. Yeah, I think I'd give anyone in the in the division trouble, so I wouldn't expect any different against Jack Harrell. What was it also going to be like for you? Because Jack's in camp with some of your friends, I believe. Carl Frampton <laughs> and I think Stephen Ward and Craig Cummings, you know well. Are they your friends yeah. also? Yeah, they're all friends. Um, Carl Frampton was actually supposed to walk me out for this fight against Phil Sutcliffe. Um, <laughs> so I was talking to Carl during the week. I think we're going to have to cast those fans. Wouldn't want to put him in a an awkward position. So, uh, do you know what? I was going to, I was supposed to fight Tommy Coyle before and he was in camp with the cars. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of used to this now. <laughs> fighting friends or, or fighting friends or friends. So, I mean, everyone in the backs and circles know each other really, don't they? So. I know you're, you're, you're all the ultimate professionals, but do, do people like yourself and Carl, out of respect for everybody involved, do you not talk for the next three, four weeks? Or, or you know, or if you do talk, you don't mention the fights? Yeah, no, I would never, I would never put him in a position to talk about another teammate. I mean, I wouldn't like him to fight one of my teammates and then ask, ask about him. So it's, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lane where you shouldn't cross during cup. And I'll, not, I'll never ask, well, how's Jack getting on spawn? Or how's Jack doing? How's his weight? Or anything like that, out of respect. Um, I would never put him in a position of it. Yeah. And vice versa, so I wouldn't expect him to say to Jack what I'm doing or anything. And how, how well do you, you know, has it gone for you in the last, say, you know, year or so? Because, you know, MTK, you know, Frank Warren shows you've been on, you've been kept really busy, haven't you, as well, which must yeah, be yeah. beneficial. 100%. Of the last, what, five, six weeks have all been on TV. I'm getting a big fan base now. Um, they've been, they've been hard, hard fights. I've never, I've never took an easy fight. 
as you can see in my record, I always state that tough fights have never turned down a fight. And this is the case again. I was offered Jack and it straight away said yes. But yeah, my career's going, going great at the minute. Haven't took a backward step. Haven't had a slip up. I'm pretty happy with, with how things are going. Where are you training for the fight? I was in Marbella for two weeks. Nice sun. Came back. I'm in Glasgow now. But I'm going down to the Liverpool this week. Who's, are you with Danny Vaughan and, and that, all them boys? Yeah, yeah, Danny Vaughan, Danny Vaughan. So Danny Vaughan lives in Glasgow, so that's where we normally have our camps. And then you'll be off to Derry's gym, I dare say. Yeah, yeah. Georgie Vaughan. Always good buzz down there. <laughs> and um, after this, I mean, I know you, you, the, your feet are on the ground, you know, firmly planted, but you win this, you really are looking towards the world, aren't you? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's for the WBO Intercontinental. Also, that puts me right up in the mix with some of the biggest names in boxing. Obviously, I won't want to, look, I won't want to be fighting or taking a backward step after the fight with a win. So, there's the likes of Ty Flanagan fighting Hooker for the is it WBO win? Yeah, or, Maurice, Maurice yeah, Cooker, yeah. That puts you, in, puts you right in the lane for that. And even even other big fights. I mean, there's O'Hara Davies and stuff there. <laughs> he doesn't like you. He doesn't like many people, O'Hara, it no. seems. But you, he tweeted the other day he's going to buy 10 Jack Catron T-shirts <laughs> at Belfast. What do you make of that? Uh, you know what, I, I, uh, I don't care. Um, he can say what he wants. He can hit me all he wants. But I love Jack Catron's reply. Did you see it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, after he beat, oh, I think you've got the same attitude. If you, as Jack, if you win the fight, you'll be going to sh shut him up, will you? Yeah, hundred percent. That's that's a fight I've really been wanting for the last two years. I mean, I don't see Jack or O'Hara Davies as anything special. I think he's very limited, so I think it's an easy fight. Before we let you go, um, we'll come and see you with the Box Nation cameras in Liverpool. I'm sure in the next week or two. But Good give stuff, us give yeah. us a prediction for the fight. Um, I believe. Uh, Jack, Jack's a brilliant fighter, so I believe he is going to go the distance. Uh, I believe I'm going to get it on points. I think uh, the first four or five rounds are very fatal to win, and then uh, I'll, I'll overtake the later rounds as well. Well, Tyron McKenna is clearly buzzing. Steve, catch true versus McKenna. I challenge you not to be hyped about this. You know what? It is one. I'm not just saying this because we've got it on Box Nation. So tune in and watch it. I'm going to tell you that anyway on the 30th. <laughs> of June. You know what? I, I haven't been so stoked for a, a little domestic matchup, should we say, for, a, you know, an international belt for a long time like this. It is a terrific fight. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, absolute credit for Jack Cattrall because, you know, he could be fighting the winner of Terry Flanagan and Maurice Hooker. Yeah. He could be fighting that winner. But instead, he's going into McKenna's backyard, an yep. England versus Ireland fight. The crowd are going to be with Tyrone McKenna. <laughs> and risking it all, risking his record. It is a fantastic fight. And I tell you what, McKenna's size, Southpaw, will give Jack plenty of problems. It's a good, good fight. And uh, as I said to Tyrone there, I feel sorry for poor Mick Conlon. He's got his first fight back in <laughs> Belfast since, oh, I think about six, seven years or something, maybe longer. And this is what happens. <laughs> Tyrone McKenna's fighting Jack Catchwell. And that's the sort of fight Belfast fight fans will pack the arena for. They're knowledgeable. They're like the York Hall crowd. They know what's a good fight. And I bet tickets have started flying out even more since that fight was announced. Well, yeah. Credit to everybody involved with that who, who, who said yes to that fight. Because you, you especially at the Catchwell side, because they're on the brink of, of something very big, a world title fight. Whereas, you know, Tyrone... It's just being, you know, he's not treading water. He's someone who's making his way up to that level. He's, you know, he's a couple of years behind Jack, you'd say, in progress. Fantastic fight. Can't wait for it. Yeah, absolutely. And a Belfast hero himself, Carl Frampton, gave it his stamp of approval online. He said it was something along the lines of this this is the best undercard that I remember seeing in Ireland. So it's it's quite something. It's really going to be a hell of a night in Belfast on June the 30th. Got a great reaction from the boxing community, from the fans. It's one we're certainly looking forward to. And Steve, I've got, I've got to ask you, what, why has Jack Cattrall taken this? I mean, he, he fought a couple of weeks ago in Leeds. Is it just because he, he got his guy out of there pretty quickly? Why, why is he doing it? Why is he putting so much on the line? Look, he has had a lot of action lately. Two very quick wins. Uh, one in Preston, one in Leeds. Um, I, I think they've sparred together. And I don't read great into sparring stories uh, at all. And I think Jack's thought, I've sparred with him. I'll take him. 
and as I say, all I'm going to do is lash, put lashings of credit mm -hmm. in Jack Jack Cattrall's direction. But, you know, it's a real awkward situation as well for people like Carl Frampton. Yeah. They train every day with Jack at the gym in Worsley um, in Manchester. And Tyro McKenna is one of Frampton's best pals. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no. it's a mad situation of Frampton. Um, sorry, Tyrone. I think he's also close with Stephen Ward and Comrade Cummings are in that gym. I know he's really close with Carl. I'd imagine that they're all in various WhatsApp groups, and Carl Frampton can kind of go between the two groups. Morning, Jack. Morning, Tyrone. <laughs> and it probably works something like that. Carl Frampton was a very likable guy in general. So uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see how he plays. As Tyrone mentioned, there he was going to walk. Um, he was going to walk him to the ring. So that's, that's not going right. to happen now, is it? That's right. And as Tyrone says, they'll speed the next couple of weeks. But Tyrone, as he said, out of respect for Jack, who he likes, and Carl, he's not going to ask him, how did Jack spar yesterday? You know, yeah. and, Carl, and Carl's not going to divulge that. And obviously, Carl, out of respect for Jack Cattrall, when he's trainer Jamie Moore, who trains him, he's not going to walk um, Tyrone to the ring now. Well, that's June 30th, live on Box Nation from the SSE Arena, Belfast. Belfast will be rocking for Mick Conlon's homecoming. He hasn't been home in years. He's coming home. Yeah, it's going to be a hell of a night. And now you've got Tyrone McKenna against Jack Cattrall. And you've got some other crackers on there as well. Check out the Frank Warren website for some more information. Check out the Box Nation website for some more information. Subscribe to watch it on the 30th. If you're in Belfast, go along. It's going to be a great night. On June 23rd, live on Box Nation, Aerith based featherweight Louis Petit is involved in a bit of a crossroads clash with Birmingham's unbeaten Raza Hamza. Now, we've had Hamza on the show a couple of times recently. He's been sparring the Japanese monster Naoa Inoue in preparation. So it was time to really hear from Louis Petit. Steve Lillis gave him a call. Louis, um, your fight against Raza Hamza is coming up. Um, is it now or never for you, really? Yes, definitely. I mean, if I, I there's no question in my head if I can't beat him, then I've got a full book on that. Well, what do you make of Reza? Because he's been quite um, vocal about punching you into retirement and stuff on, on the podcast last week. What do you make of that? And what do you make of him uh, as a boxer? I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't know he said that. Yeah, he said he was going to, you know, um, send you into retirement. Um, well, we'll see what we find. Like, I'm pretty sure he won't. But, um, no, I'll, literally, I think uh, it's probably a bit too soon for him. He probably thinks, I, I, I don't know, I haven't boxed, so he probably thinks I'm finished or something like that, I'd imagine. But... I boxed once last year, but I've still been in the gym, pretty much, just waiting for dates, really. I mean, he's been training in Japan with Nao Inui. Does that give him any sort of an advantage, or what, what does it do for you when you go and spar with a world-class fighter? Um, he definitely would have come out of there in good spirits and feeling good, but at the end of the day, it's just fine. Do you know what I mean? Yourself, you do well for yourself outside of boxing. Um... And you, you know, you left boxing for a while after the Bobby Jenkinson, you know, upset loss, which was an upset. You was number four in the world at the time. What gave you the impetus to get back in the gym and fight again? I, I never actually left. I just couldn't get dates. So I mean, I, I stayed in the gym the whole time from that fight. And the only time I've ever spoke of it is now. So if I can't beat Brad up, then obviously I don't. I, 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 I'm not as good as I think I am. I can't box to the level I think I can. So I shouldn't really be boxing. Well, what what sort of titles are you looking at um, in the immediate future? Any, Steve. I mean, anything will be good. Um, any one of the Intercontinentals, obviously, so that gives you a good rating. And I know the fights it can pull you into. Um, obviously, the IBF would be a good route with Josh Warren and winning that belt. That would be wicked. I'm sure every featherweight in the country would love to go and fight at Ellen Road in front of these crazy fans. Or obviously the British, the British is there. I don't know what the current situation is with that at the moment. I think Walsh has still got it, but obviously he's won it outright and I don't know what he's doing. I mean, it looks like Warrington might have a voluntary at Leeds Arena later this year um, before you know they, they they do finally make a Frampton fight if he can remain champion and Frampton can keep winning. So you'll be the ideal voluntary, wouldn't you, if you won this week? Yeah, I mean, I'll be the first one at the office to sign to be the voluntary for there, definitely. <laughs> what did you make of Josh the other week against Selby? Unbelievable performance, but I don't think... Uh, I think it was just... He was, he was going to win no matter what that night. You could just tell by the way he was walking through the punches and what was coming at him, the crowd and the occasion. I think it's something that he's obviously thought about so long that I don't think anybody would have stopped him. But um, now, he, he's got to obviously keep that 
momentum and build from that. Do you know what I mean? How do you keep? How did you keep momentum going when you lost to Bobby Jenkins, and especially when so many of us thought you were nailed on to win the fight? It's hard, Steve. I'm not going to lie. I blew up in weight when it got massive. Do thinking, what am I doing? Should I box? Shouldn't I box? All them sort of things go through your head. But this is something I've done since I was eight years old. So I mean, for the last twenty years. All I've ever known is boxing, really. Although I've got other stuff going on outside, it's just I'm, I'm lost without boxing. I come four o'clock every night when it comes time to go gym. So I mean, I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't do it. And then, but, but you can't ever replace that momentum of fighting. That's the only thing I'm missing at the moment. I need to box. I need to fight. I need to get rounds. They're, they're talking about maybe making me a reser for a title, but I need more rounds before I can start even thinking. Jumping straight into a 10 or 12 round title. Fight. Yeah. And I don't think Alan Smith, your trainer, would let you either, would he, unless he was confident? You know, because I know. Alan's very clever. I mean, I, I know I could beat rather than 6, 8, 10, or 12. But I'm obviously going to put myself at this one. I'm going to try and do the 12 rounds, then the 10, then the 8, then the 6. I'm better off doing it in the other order. Do you know what I mean? Well, what's it like with Alan? Because he's one of these trainers who everybody knows he sees fighters before anything, isn't it? He doesn't think of money. It's just pure he's fighters, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good in the gym. We've got so, all of us have got such a good relationship. We all work hard and we all compete, but literally the minute training is done, we're all friends. We're all a good time. And what what was that? What, what's it been like in the gym since Bradley got beat? It must have been a big shock draw when he, he come unstuck. Yeah, it's been tough. To be fair, we've had a tough couple of months with Brad and a couple of other things, so we we had to really all come together and work hard lately in the gym. But we all win together, we all lose together. I mean, Brad was in the other day. He, the first day back now, put him straight in sparring, helping Johnny Coyle. So and then he was helping Johnny Garden last week as well. So I mean, literally, we're all just there for one another. And um, I'm sure you're confident you're going to give him something to smile about on June 23rd to bounce back from Bradley's setback. Yeah, I mean, I think me and me and Johnny Garton and Jake will go and put the gym back on a high and sort of go into the summer or the new season, if you like, in September in you know, a high. Well, before we let you go, we've got to ask, how is Jake looking, your, your younger brother? Uh, incredible in the gym this week. He looks so good sparring. I mean, uh, we just, every time, every time we get him someone to spar or someone harder or a bit bigger, he just seems to know how to deal with them. So he even surprises us. <laughs> OK, put this one on you. Who's going to go the furthest in boxing as a boxer, yourself or Jake? Jake. Steve, good to hear from Lewis Petit. Interesting little uh, note at the end there where he said his, his brother Jake Petit's going to go further. Is that just kind of him being humble? What would you make of it? No, uh, there's a lot expected of Jake from that gym down there in, uh, in Kent that um, their trainer Alan Smith has. Um, there's Bradley Skeet, Johnny Garton. And uh, they, they see very much see Jake as a bit of a precocious talent. But Alan Smith, the trainer, knows what he's doing. And I don't think we'll see Jake in any sort of fight for 18 months or so. Mm. He's 19 years of age. He, you know, he did all he had to do as an amateur, but he kept getting missing call-ups for the for the big squads and stuff. So he went pro. I look at it, that baby face and I yeah. perhaps wonder he'd stayed, I'd like to have seen him stay amateur another year or so, but Alan Smith won't take any risk of him for a couple of years. But there's seriously expectations of him from a lot of people um, down there at the gym. Well, his career couldn't have had a better start. A little bit of trivia for you, Steve. His first fight was on Box Nation. It was you know indeed. Who, I was, I, I was there. It was the first fight on the night and he, he got a really bad cut against a kid yes. Sheffield um, who, who was from the Ingle camp, I think. And he got a really bad cut. And it was the first fight of the night on Box Nation on a night where no one could get to Brentwood, but everybody did in the end because of floods on a train track. And I literally <laughs> got there just in time. And what are you going to tell me now as well? Well, I'm, I've got to tell you, Steve. I mean, his career couldn't have had a better possible start. Guess who was introducing him? Guess who the ring announcer was that night? Go back and check the tapes. It was your boy, Dev. Sony, yeah, I baby did it. Do you buffer. remember? Baby remember? buffer was there that night, yeah. <laughs> a baby buffer was there. Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a bit of an interesting night. I announced a few fights. First time I've ever kind of done it on TV and then handed over the reins to the big dog, Mark Burdis. It was like a... Uh, it was like a kind of hand over to you know um, Michael Buffer, like they do in America. Sometimes they get they get the lesser MCs to do a few, and then they hand it over, and that's what kind of happened that night. But fun night. Tell me about Lewis Petit and Raza Hamza then. A real crossroads fight. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you know, you both look at their records. You think, well, no, a loss doesn't mean the end for you, and of course it shouldn't do. But when you look at it, we're seeing more and more. Frank Warren is starting to match his fighters together. Mm. I think there's. Um, is it Troy Williamson and Jack Flatley coming up in Manchester this weekend? Mm. They've both got promotional deals with Frank. Um, he's starting to put his fighters together and the winner 
of that fight will kick on to, to much bigger things. The, and the loser, it really is a long climb back. And they both know this. Well, yeah. And actually, Raza Hamza said that if he can't beat Louis Petit, he's going to retire. So you've got two fighters. One of them's not, never going to fight again, apparently, after this. It's, it, 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 we're talking about, you know, really good domestic fights that, you know, people look forward to. He mentioned about Cattrall against Tyrone, Jack Cattrall, Tyrone McKenna a little earlier. This one quite, quite isn't quite on that scale. But with both boys talking retirement, if they lose... You sh you, you show it shows they're willing to leave it all in there on the night, and I'm sure they both will. June 23rd, O2 Arena, live on Box Nation. That's one of the fights coming up. There's plenty going on that night. Check out the Box Nation website for details on the full card. Well, Steve, it's that time of the week again. Our listeners want to know. I want to know. We all want to know. What are you talking about, Lillis? Ah, oh, what am I talking about, Dev? I'm talking about Tyson Fury this weekend. How can we do a podcast and not mention the name Tyson Fury? He is the man who has got the boxing world talking yet again. And his fight, his, his comeback fight after two and a half years out is uh, upon us this weekend in Manchester. The thing is, I'm just fascinated to see what he can do. He can, you know, you know, look, we know he's got fit. He shed a load of weight. I've been seeing him every night in the gym I use, and he is in fantastic shape. But is he boxing fit? You know, there's a lot of people seem to doubt it. But what my point is, George Foreman did it after 10 years out. Ooh. Henry must come back and beat Virgil Hunter after a similar sort of layoff, a long, long layoff. You know, so my opinion is don't back against Tyson doing it, rediscovering the form of 2015 and unifying the belts over the next 18 months. You can do it, Tyson. Well, I've been looking at some of the training videos that have been coming out. He, he looks good. He looks in good shape. He's moving about the ring quite well. He looks like he's, he's lost all that weight. There's those before and after pictures. It's a really fascinating journey to uh, to follow. And um, yeah, I mean, the boxing world will be following what Tyson Fury can do. I've got to say, there's been a bit of talk about this Sefa Safari um, opponent as well, Steve. I think that's all right for a comeback fight, isn't it? You know what? Some people just want to have a go to have a go. Mm. He's still only 29, 30. So in heavyweight terms, he's still a young man. So I've no problem with the opponent. Give Tyson a break. And I'm, I have got a hunch he's going to rediscover his best form and prove a lot of people wrong. One thing he's shown during this by shedding all this weight after the way he'd been living was how mentally strong he is and determined he is. Well, we are a 24-7 boxing channel here at Box Nation. And here's what's coming up. A little taster. So how about Thursday, 4 o'clock? Terence Crawford against Dieri Jean. Now, Jean had taken Lamont Peterson the distance. Crawford had him up and down like a yo-yo and got him out of there in the 10th round. So this will really kind of whet the appetite ahead of Crawford's step up to welterweight on Saturday night challenge for that world title Thursday 4 o'clock Crawford versus John Friday at 7 o'clock Bunce's Boxing Hour it's free to air on Sky Channel 427 he'll be previewing the weekend's action he'll be reviewing what's happened in the week of boxing last week's show with him and Barry was absolutely incredible they look back on the lives of Dean Francis and Brendan Ingle it was emotional uh, you know, it, have have the tissues ready if you're going to catch up with that one. It's available on watch.boxnation.com, as are all of Bunce's Boxing Hour shows. So do catch up with that. Friday at 11.30, he might be the best welterweight in the world. We bring you Errol Spence, his last fight against Lamont Peterson. Maybe you've been out for a, a few drinks. Yeah, maybe you've, you've, you've come home and you've still got a bit of testosterone in your system. You're a bit hyped up. Why don't you go and watch the best welterweight in the world, Errol Spence, bang up Lamont Peterson for a few rounds. It was a great fight. And that was Errol Spence. That's Friday at 11.30. And of course, Saturday, 1.30 a.m. Terence Crawford, Jeff Horn, WBO World Welterweight title. We can't wait for that here at Box Nation. It's going to be a cracker. Is it going to be the upset? Is Horn going to change his nickname to the upsetter after upsetting Manny Pacquiao already? Or is Terence Crawford going to do exactly what is expected of him by the boxing world and become the WBO World Welterweight champion? Now, we're adding fights all the time to the schedule. Make sure you're following us on social media so you know exactly what's going on. And I mean properly follow us. Stalk us. Scroll through the feed. Like images from a year ago. We don't care. Don't worry about it. We don't think it's weird. 
come and like our stuff and keep those iTunes reviews coming in as well. It really helps with the visibility of the show. And remember, Saturday night, 1.30 a.m., it's Crawford versus Horn. It's live on Box Nation. Thanks, Steve. We'll see you next week.